this particular one happens to be in Darwin's farm. Now the owner can innovate in what he produces, what he sells. At the moment, it's diapers, but he could innovate in baby products, powder, cream, and all this kind of thing. So you can innovate in relation to your adults, what you deliver. And as I said before, this is not just at the level of the organization, but down to the teams as well. You can innovate in how you do things, processes. In fact, our research indicates that roughly 90% of innovations within an organization are innovations in process rather than process. This is how you do things. You can innovate in position. This is how you communicate with the outside world and how it communicates with you. So, for example, Skype Palace, at the moment, <coughs> they have a shop assistant, their people come. Maybe they should have a Facebook page. Maybe they should be sharing uh, stories of uh, great experiences that mothers have, and so on. So, innovation in positioning yourself in how you signal who you are, what you are, and communicate is another aspect of innovation. And the last one is the most difficult to understand. <coughs> Excuse me. It's innovation in paradigm. By paradigm, I mean the way that you think. So if we take the palace at the moment, the way that they think is we will provide basic needs as cheaply as possible. Now, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but it might be possible for a business like this to say, well, our mission is to provide the best possible help for mothers in choosing the baby products which are right for their baby. Now, that's a different way of thinking. When you go in, you don't say, oh, I want one packet of those, and you take it, you say, oh, well, I've got the, my baby has this rash or this weight problem or whatever it is. And they say, well, you know, this is the best advice that's available that afternoon. <coughs> now, that's a different way of thinking. It's difficult to explain because the way of thinking about who we are and what we do becomes a fact. This is who we are. But actually, sometimes it needs to adapt, evolve, and change. I'll come back to this in a few months. So, now for the example. And in this example, I'm going to discuss another aspect of innovation management, the last one I'm going to touch, which is to do with the context within which organizations operate. I'm going to call it the innovation ecosystem. <coughs> and in order to make this uh, lecture as relevant as possible, excuse me, I'm going to use the example of UK universities over the last 60 years or so, and how they had innovated. Now, this is different from how universities in India have innovated, universities in, <coughs> in South America, different from the African universities and so on. So I am not putting this forward as, well, this is the way to go. But this description and understanding the ecosystem should help you to identify opportunities, some of which, maybe a few, maybe 5%, are worth taking further. So, ecosystems analysis provides a systematic way in which an organization can look at a context within which it operates, predict how that context may change, and then to select opportunities to explore, to commit to, to put into practice, and to exploit the benefit. In fact, to understand where innovation in what we do product, what we produce, and how we do things, process, 
and how we position ourselves, how we communicate with the outside world in relation to positioning and the way in which we think about ourselves as an institution, innovation in power. So let's go back to the 1960s. At that time, I think 4% of the UK population went to university. So it tended to be elitist. You know, most people didn't go. And universities saw themselves as being self-contained. In other words, universities, each one, just as they've done in medieval times, needed its own teaching staff to deal with everything, had its own laws, its own rules, and so on and so forth. It was a community which was largely self-contained, self-governing, self-directed. It had an academic mission in that it saw its task as taking the great academic work which had been developed over the centuries and communicating that in effective ways to students. And there were virtually no technological aids whatsoever. None of these projectors, nothing like that. It was mainly to do with lecturing and small group work. And this was the way in which universities published in the 90s. By the 1980s, there was a huge change. The government decided that it was important to have many more people go to universities, so they expanded. They became three times larger. <clears throat> and what began to happen was that academics began to cooperate much more between universities, forming areas of common interest which they could pursue and follow. And interestingly, there were big changes in educational technology, so it became understood that different forms of active group work really helped the learning process. So rather than one-way communication, right, I'm doing it now, there was much more opportunity for interaction. And technology began to be used. I remember at this time, for example, we began to use concept television to record key lectures and things like that. By the time we get to the beginning of this century, another wave of change has happened. Universities have become mainstream. Up to 40% of the population in some areas went to universities. So they developed a whole raft of new products. They innovated in their outputs. Much more applied kinds of courses were developed, a much greater range of products were offered. And this acronym, EASE, stands for Economic and Social Engagement. The universities changed their mission, so rather than just being better they began to set objectives for developing the communities within which they operate. They had a responsibility for social and economic development, for the stimulation of good practice around their particular university areas. And by this time, there were multiple technological services. In fact, the burden of teaching began to be taken, not just by teachers in a real life situation like we are now, but there were increasing numbers of ways in which learning could be promoted and contained outside of the teaching, formal teaching environment, and there was an enormous amount of experimentation in making that. So when we get to today in the UK, and the uh, symbol here is on the, an annual survey which is conducted by one of our top newspapers. It's called the Good University Guide. And in this Good University Guide, every university is compared and contrasted on, <coughs> if I remember rightly, about 55 parameters. Whether the students are happy, whether the environment is exciting, whether they uh, whether the students have counselling services, 
whether the academic standard uh, proportion of time for students and so on and so forth. So it's become much more performance management oriented and students compare universities against these parameters with other universities. Why is this important? Well, if you're a university and you're fairly low down, your students are not happy, then you start to do something about it. So rather than universities setting their own agendas of what they needed to do, universities have increasingly become student directed they, they are seen to provide a service for students which, like other services, can be assessed and is focused on the return of investment. So employability and a superior lifestyle has become a main objective. This is an innovation in power. It's a different way of thinking about the purpose of the university. And increasingly they are technology dependent. In other words, multiple forms of technology, you know, getting your lectures on your smartphone and things like this are actually perfect. So what happens is, if we look at the context within an organization that works, we find that political factors, what the government says we should do, makes a difference. As does economic factors, universities need to get revenues, and these revenues must exceed their costs. So what actually is paid for? So we have political, economic, and social factors. Big change in society, what people expect, what they need. Now students go through that Sunday Times list that I mentioned a few moments ago, and they use that to select their university. So they're more like consumers. Technical factors. The rise in technology, and actually a lot of low-cost technologies, has transformed quite a number of activities. For example, research is now greatly helped by different technologies. Environmental issues can make a difference as well. What's happened is that the interest in the environment has begun to be a significant driver of how, for example, campuses are laid out, the way in which they operate. They want to be role models. And lastly, legal issues to do with their charge. So we're looking at, and the acronym is PESCO. This is the one we use. Political, Economic, Social, Technical, Environmental, and Legal Issues. And if we look at the landscape within which you operate, and ask what is driving change generally in those areas, that begins to give you an opportunity to undertake a systematic 